Welcome to Local is Lekker, where we look for lekker stories about local businesses. And today we are visiting Kyla and Dylan Stevens on their small holding in the Asagai Valley. And it's really amazing to see how Dylan and Kyla are able to sustain themselves farming their little chicken garden. Uh, a big eye opener for me who grew up on a timber farm where every tree is planted in a completely straight Germanic line. Dylan is also a, a very keen beekeeper and we end off visiting one of his hives and we get to taste some honey. So thank you for joining us today. Hi there, my name is Dylan Stephen and uh, this is Kayla Stephen. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we've uh, recently gotten married and for nine years we were pretty much pen pals and we spoke on the computer. <laughs> Before I came here. Um, I worked at a resort that was 20 minutes from where I lived. I lived in a very small town that <laughs> 600 is people. considered a village um, in British Columbia. Uh, yeah, and then I've always uh, wanted to come to South Africa. Um, just perks, I found a boy that lives here. And it's warm all year, so I'm happy. I hate the snow. So about seven years ago, we started renting here in the lovely valley of Asaka, just, just past Chanticleer Hotel. Built a chicken garden, which is just a pleasure that uh, chickens run free in. And uh, you can also farm in or garden. Um, there are segments to it so I can keep the chickens out of areas I don't want them to, to eat. So it was that for quite a while and then uh, I got uh, the landlord to, to join on uh, to the idea of permaculture, which is, uh, which is something I believe in. It's, it's, it's the only sustainable way I can see someone living off of their own power and their own uh, uh, their own doing. It's all these other methods that require a lot of input, they ultimately aren't sustainable. Um, for something to be sustainable it has to sustain itself. You can't have to have constant input. We finished the fence at the beginning of the year and we were digging the trenches the year before so at the end of this year it'll be one year. But with permaculture, it's incremental growth. It's building on what you have. Uh, it's, it's improving on what you have. It's not destroying your slate and trying to impose, in a, des impose a design on it. Um, yeah, so I've been using this time here renting as a, a way to learn different things, not to ultimately execute them, but just to learn how they work uh, learn how they function and just learn what's involved. So I got chickens, I have bees as well, which has become a very promising aspect for me. And uh, I've also looked into hydroponics and also worm farming. And all these aspects are something I want to bring together one day on a property. Um, preferably an old dilapidated farm. Um, the idea of permaculture is not to, to keep creating new, it's to reuse what we have and to improve it. My whole thing is going to be under a name more along the lines of uh, the grapevine, which the way I see it is it's you, you have this main connecting vine holding all these little assets together. I've been fortunate enough that there's a factory on this property that manufactures furniture. It's been here for the last 24 years or so. Uh, which allowed me to, to really get into beekeeping, uh, which I've been focusing on for the last two years. Yeah, so we've been, I've been manufacturing beehives uh, for people just as a form of income. Through all of that I've been learning about beekeeping to ultimately bring it back to this bigger idea of permaculture that can be taught to other people and uh, shown to other people to, to give them an understanding what sustainability is rather than this life of just consuming and using up and not knowing how things are made, uh, where things come from, things can be 
very simple to make and we, we assume we don't have time but uh, there will always be time to do stuff so and it's as simple as instead of throwing out a little bit of water you put it on a pot plant it might not seem like a, a big thing but it's it's your mindset that you would rather want to put that on a plant than down the sink so what this is that i'm standing on now is what we refer to as a swale um, so what you do to construct one is you dig a trench and all the soil gets dumped to the one side of the trench and you repeat that going down the hill uh, so what it achieves is uh, water penetration into the ground normally on a f flat hill or flat sloped hill the water will flow down in the first top layer uh, with this it allows the water to get caught uh, into into the ground and it preserves a lot of the moisture that's that you get um, and it allows for you to not water as often we still do all our bath water gets pumped here and gets sprayed onto here every time the tank fills up and even that it allows a lot of the water to get deep down very quickly and not just sitting on the surface and evaporating the next day now that we're in winter so this can be repeated what you do is you follow the the contours of the land and you just you can go as far as you want but the idea of permaculture is trying to use a very dense piece of land and not plants growing in the wild they don't you don't see every plant in the nature reserve by itself growing they just intertwine so it uh, may look messy but there's many different plants that can be pointed out here um, and they're just left to grow amongst each other uh, so you can use the benefits of things there's a lot of teachings that speak about companion planting but uh, it doesn't work when you put one plant there and then one plant there they actually have to grow amongst each other we've got a pumpkin growing everywhere it's uh, just going nuts and it's been producing quite a few pumpkins this season uh, there's one here that's been hidden from the monkeys under some dirt so now these vines have dried up so this is ready to to go inside and they can sit on the shelf whoopsie <laughs> they can sit on their shelf for a good year once they've left to dry it's one plant that's been growing here for quite a while we have melon pears at the top here which are finally coming into fruit they taste exactly like a melon and a pear at the same time. It's quite unusual. There's ginger that's busy dying back now that we're in winter, as well as a, a local, or well, it comes from India, but it's very popular here. It's called uh, taro or indumbis. They got set back. Before we had the fence here, they were about this tall. Uh, the local wild pigs thought that was very wonderful and uh, it was all for them so they came and destroyed everything luckily with these type of plants you just need a small piece of its root and it will grow back again so i collected all the bits of remains put them in some water got them to root they they won't do this this good this year because they've been set back and they're growing now in winter so hopefully next year i'll get something there um, through everything here which is kind of hidden we have a cherry tomato that's just doing its own thing. Um, as long as another pumpkin here that's trying to grow. Oh, nope, it rotted. So a vine will put a stretch out, it'll put its flowers out. Every flower will get pollinated if there's bees around, but the vine will ultimately decide, no, we only want four on here because there's only that much nutrients coming in. And then a few of them will get destroyed there's worms in here so the chickens will love this they can go running after it yeah and then there's a what else do we have here there's a small basil that's coming up here it's starting to grow there's more melon pears these trees we have growing here as well they are elderflower trees and uh, you can make a champagne from them uh, which is pretty simple to do there's an avo tree and a lemon tree more basil so with permaculture you want to get all your base plants down the, 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 the plants that take longer to grow um, 
and as they grow up you start introducing smaller plants around them. So the main idea in the first year of this was just getting all our trees down and uh, some of the peppers that we enjoy as well. We have some pineapples as well. So there's, a, there's quite a diverse range of plants here and they're just left, left to grow amongst each other. It is an odd way of doing things from traditional gardening but it is, it's how plants grow so it's not, it's not forced. We don't expect a certain yield from things. Um, it's really letting nature take a bit more control over the process because there are so many tools in nature to do the things we need that we don't have to produce massive amounts of compost and the fertilizers and chemicals and all of that. And it's many people believe a plant cannot get diseased if it's in its right environment. If it has what, it's need, if it, has what it needs, you, you won't have a problem. So it's providing what nature needs so we ultimately gain from it. Um, and for, for many years now we haven't been doing that. We, we have this expectation that everything is just presented. So we, we really need to understand where things come from. We've lost our uh, understanding for, for how things grow and I mean for, f because of that we, we just don't appreciate things. It's just always oranges, it's just always potatoes, it's just, it's always there. I mean, back in the day, you would have apple cider parties where people go press all their apples because they were falling out their ears, they didn't know what to do with all of them. And now we just have apples. Don't need to worry about that. We have whatever we need, it's just at the shops. And the thing is, it's, it's separated us. We, we don't rely on anyone. The guy who has that machine, we all go together and use it. There's just no community in that sense. So with relying on each other and, and learning about how things are made and where they come from, you, 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 do, you start to appreciate things a lot more. Uh, so it's, it's a journey. <laughs> it's not something you just learn overnight, but it's, it is worth it, I would say. That's one of uh, Hans's chickens. It's not my favorite one. <laughs> At five in the morning, <laughs> that thing starts crying. Uh, I keep telling the landlord to send it back to Dio Valente. <laughs> they can use it at least. <laughs> it just wakes everyone up here. <laughs> this plant you can just snap off and throw over there and it starts growing there. It's called Doggone. It does have another name, but it has a very strong, strong smell that dogs particularly don't like and other bugs. So. The, that's why in between these, these uh, swells there will just be stuff growing to attract bugs, deter bugs, all those type of things. You've got to get the good bugs in here, chase all the bad ones out. It's quite a handy plant to have around. Yeah, so right now the chickens are running around. <laughs> they self-medicate, so they're trying to find the different plants that they need um, to, to help with anything that's uh, bugging them at any point. So they run around and they'll go find different plants that are what they need. They'll go look for, for comfrey plants or the different basils and the different herbs that are in your garden. Even different wild plants that they need. Because they need a mixture of green and, uh, and dry. So you can't just give chickens dry food. You really have to make sure they get a, a complete mixture of uh, greenery as well as dry. So when I started all of this uh, I had gotten my chickens going and I uh, had been wanting to do bees and uh, it's, it was uh, not something I knew anything about but most websites would say find your local beekeeper. <laughs> so I knew my uncle uh, had a friend uh, who was doing bee removals. He had he had been doing it for about three years and uh, I called him just to ask could I get a beehive from him because I want to try to learn. So he just said, oh, do you want to come on a removal this afternoon? So I was like, alright, so I can do that. So I went and helped, I didn't really help, I just watched, looked, took pictures of the removal happening and he invited me to another one and I helped out a bit on it and uh, yeah, so he, 
he liked the hand, the extra help, so he invited me to a few more and it's really where my understanding of bees came from, from doing uh, bee removals. <laughs> removals, I, I do them, but they, they're a lot of work and they take a lot of time. I knew I enjoyed bees, but I knew it wasn't, it wasn't playing to my strength. So I carried on with it for a while, while learning all my other things. And then I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a, uh, another beekeeper that's in this valley. His name's uh, Gary Edwards. I told him I have a woodwork factory on the property where I'm renting and I'm allowed to use it. I could probably try and make a half or two for you. So he said, yeah, show me what you can make and we'll, we'll work from there. And I made him 10 and then he liked it. He asked for another 10. And then I just started spending a lot of time making beehives and making stock for, for his shop. And uh, it showed me the side of beekeeping I like, which was actually manufacturing beehives. Um, and, and the maintenance of bees, looking after them. Uh, the first lot of hives I made for, for Gary were just normal wood from the hardware store, uh, a very expensive wood. And I had to very quickly start finding a place that could supply me with, with wood. And uh, Gary himself said you could try Heart Eco because he would get plywood from them for the odd thing he would do around the house. So I went to go take a look and yeah, it was exactly what I needed. And Everything from that day was just all heart eco wood. So it was quite, a, I could say, a godsend because I knew nothing about wood. I, frankly, you call a, a mill and you say, I need, I need a plank this size. They'll say, sorry, we work in cubic meters. And I'm like, but is the plank that size? The plank can be any size. And it's just like, oh no, this, I can't deal with that. But uh, I went down there to Shangweni and uh, there was the exact type of plank I needed and uh, yeah, it worked out great. Yeah, so these are my happy bees that have, uh, are working away and bringing in a lot of pollen by the looks of it. So they, even though we were in winter, they are still finding a lot of flowers to forage, which is very good. This one is my rescue. We've brought them down here into some full sun and uh, they, hey, they're doing a lot better than they used to be. Those are my grumpy ladies. <laughs> They, they, never, they never make maintenance easy for me. Uh, it's always a mission. And it's quite funny that I can actually pick up a personality from these, from these different hives. So this is a customer's hive that I've got uh, sitting here. They, we like to sell a hive that we know is, is going to have a good chance at surviving. So when these got transferred into the customer's box, box they, they, went, they, they had a bit of growth to do. So. They're sitting here, they've been here for the last week. Gonna leave them for another week or two, just so they can uh, grow. But they, they're they a very, very healthy swarm at the moment. And so I started getting a lot busier making boxes. It was, it was becoming a full-time job for me um, that I enjoyed. And then one day I really needed wire for doing my frames. And Chris again said, just go down to Pine Town and take a look. I went down there and uh, got introduced to Dave Bowden, uh, who does beekeeping as well. And from day one, he took me under his wing and he loved what I was making, but he knew uh, I could improve and uh, everything I needed to improve was there. Uh, I just needed a place. So he was, I was very fortunate to, for that to happen to me. It's taken this from a kind of hobby job to, to something that's, that's feasible for me and also sustainable. And I, I can take this forward and grow. Dave uh, allowed me to start manufacturing my boxes from his factory. I was just doing my own thing. More and more, he, he started to, to, to guide me and mentor me in, in, in what's, what was right and how things could be done better in terms of the manufacturing of a product which was still a lot that I needed to learn. Um, at, here at home, I was kind of a hillbilly at the way I went about things, just learning as I was doing it. Um, and I, I was able to make something, but obviously there's always room for improvement. Unfortunately, their factory manager had a few troubles and had to leave. And I started getting a bit of the workload of the factory put on my shoulders, and one day, Dave sat me down and was said, 
do you, do you want to work here? It's, yeah, it's flip, it's, it's gone into sixth gear from there. Uh, we've been making boxes, he, he's been very kind to still let me carry on with my customers and together we, yeah, we're, we're trying to build something that, that, that can service the community because it's, there's many people making beehives but to have a standard product that's reliable and someone who can dispense information on the product there are few and far between so we still make I still make hives out of wood from Heart Eco unfortunately with it being a recycled wood I can't demand the product it has to be there for me to use it so when I have access to it we still make our hives we refer to them as a, a recycled hive um, most of the components besides the screws are everything's recycled the aluminium lid uh, all the wood everything else on it so it's become an option that I offer now but going forward when it comes to producing quantity and something I can rely on and needs to be shipped out uh, and everything is the same I was introduced to shutter ply which is an exterior ply um, they use it on the outsides of buildings before uh, the facades put on it so it's it's designed to be out in the weather before treating and it'll provide you a lot more uh, predictability you know what you're getting you know how many you can get you you know when you drill holes there aren't going to be a, a, a knot there that you have to now get rid of so it's something you know when someone says can I have a hundred halves you can get it done in a certain amount of time um, it is a superior product it's what we like to say is uh, it's the advancement I mean wood is wood but with this it lasts longer there aren't any uh, unpredictabilities with it because everything's been laminated and there's so many layers in, in, in this wood nothing bends or warps it's much stronger it will stand the test of time so this is what we call the future it's it's a product designed to be outside you know so this is our workhorse in in our factory um, 80 percent of all the machining will, will be done on a table saw it's a sliding table so it's this obviously slides back and forth you can put all your wood along here which allows you to move everything very easily normal table saws the tables fixed on both sides so this just helps with moving things these are going to be used for pollination um, purely because of the size and obviously the customer's request but uh, when it comes to different halves you have your pollinating halves you have a garden half which is halves that people don't move a lot so they tend to be a bit bigger and more component based while this uh, pollination hive will be very basic and compact to allow them to transport around the country because their biggest issue is moving all these bees so we do a round hole that's flat with no landing board so all these halves can back up to each other and fits on a truck very neatly and gets strapped down. Funny enough, honey isn't the bee end all of beekeeping because it's so inconsistent when it comes to whether you're going to get it or not at the end of each season so pollination is uh, exactly the lifeblood behind a, an in, this industry purely because of its consistency and how much it's needed there's quite an array of of people that need uh, pollination services whether they're aware of it or not is, is one of our challenges but it's a simple matter of just showing it working and people realizing that their crops can be increased up to 8-9% which to a farmer growing millions and millions of nuts is a lot more nuts
sort it. You just put a little bit of wax salt to stop the thing expanding, otherwise you'll never get it open again. And then everything slots together nice and neatly. And so as they say, the customer is always right. So uh, we like to make a, a, range, a range of things for, for everyone. We do stock all different styles. To some this might look like they're all the same, um, but they're not. <laughs> So we like to offer everything here. Um, we have all the smokers for everyone, from small to large. Uh, we have all the different frames, all the different super sizes, all the different brood frames that anyone would need. We also offer everything in flat pack for the people who like to assemble them themselves or save a bit of money doing so. All the wire that people need to wire their frames, we have as well, as well as any wax that people may need for their frames. So after a while of making halves, I, I had to branch out and uh, I got introduced to uh, a wonderful person across the valley here. Uh, he runs Dio Valente and uh, it's a poultry emporium. And he wanted to get into bees um, and get going with that as uh, another aspect to, to what he's trying to achieve. We've partnered up in a sense where I'm doing maintenance for him. Um, he bought a bunch of halves from me, which was uh, one of another great help in getting me started. And uh, yeah, let's go take a look at that. Uh, we'll show you his setup and how I do maintenance when people need help with their bees and a few other things that are involved in, in beekeeping. Welcome to Deo Volente. We started a a honey project in, uh, in January, my boys and myself, and uh, today we are harvesting for the first time. So we have our 10 beehives, we've put them on vandal proof elevated stands, so they, um, they are up in the air, two and a half meters in the air. Uh, we put them in in January, and we initially anticipated that the, uh, the, we'll harvest in about August, September, so we're two months early. We had opened them up a month or two ago and we were quite amazed how full they were already. So today is the day when we will do the proper harvesting. So this is our beekeeping jacket. Um, purely to give you a bit of peace of mind while doing some beekeeping. The most important thing though is a smoker. Um, you, many guys will do uh, inspection without a suit. One or two halves is not a problem without a suit and a smoke, just using a smoker. It gives me a little bit of peace of mind knowing that I don't have to worry about getting stung and I can just get to work. So this is an old smoker that was uh, passed down to me. But what we use in here is either sawdust, straw, anything that really burns will help. Just obviously nothing toxic. So this is obviously a bit overkill, but it just speeds things up for me. Now the reason why I have to use a smoker is naturally bees in the wild, if they get any s s smell of smoke, they get worried and start to eat their honey in preparation to move on in case uh, their hive is about to burn. So by us smoking them, it distracts them and causes them to go and eat honey while we are busy working. If we had to overuse the smoke, it might cause them to leave. Today we're inspecting these halves. It's come at the end of the gum flow season. So we're coming to see if there's any honey in these ones. <coughs> we did an inspection earlier on in April and found there was some promising signs. So we'll see what there is. We always want to give a bit of time for our smoke to work. just do this to keep everything clean 
otherwise build up causes it, become, it to become very hard to do maintenance. So about twice a season we like to do maintenance at least, anything less than that is not enough. Now this is an outer frame which we normally would replace now since they don't use it. This is normally where they keep a lot of their pollen. Just always remember to keep smoke otherwise you will lose control of them. This is some comb that has a bit of honey and pollen that the bees are busy eating because of the smoke. There's another frame that shows there's a bit of brood, there's a lot of honey at the top and there are eggs which is a good sign that the queen is laying. And as we can see a whole sheet of brood that they've been working very hard These bees still have a lot of growth ahead of them. They are probably now a year old from when they were caught and placed into their first box. They are growing well, but a bit of feeding will now will be needed during the winter months to help them ensure that they can get through the season without a problem. So now that I have a frame that I need to replace, I will need to make a note on this hive to remind me that it will be necessary to do that and give them new space to grow. The way I make notes to remind myself is on my phone I have an app that is called B+. What it allows me to do is to scan the barcode on the front of this hive it shows me which hive this is and it allows me to add an inspection. Last time I had a note show that said they're not pulling wax but they have pulled wax now so that is an improvement. We shall add an inspection mentioning that we need to give them new frames and also a note saying have pulled wax which is an improvement. So they are improving which is a good thing especially coming towards winter. So now I've set a note to remind me that now I need to inspect these and give them new frames. Alright I'm just going to inspect this one next door just to see what's up with them. As we can see here some honey that these bees have been storing and they've also been storing on this side and still have to cap it off. So you can see some capped honey and some more capped honey. Now this colony has actually absconded. These frames can be very hard to take out sometimes. Okay, what appears to have happened with this colony is that they somehow lost their queen and they made a new one. But now it's not all well and good when they've made a new one because the queen still has to go out and mate. Now because she's a very slow flying bug, she often gets eaten by forktail drongos or honey guards. This is unfortunate but a very, very stark reality of beekeeping. These days it is not so easy to keep bees with the climate we have or the changes that the climate experiences. One year they have food, the next year they don't. The bees that we do see in there now are purely from robbing. It is other bees in the area trying to get an easy meal. These bees are not aggressive at all because they just want to eat. They will not protect this honey like a colony would. 
many people I know have lost over hundreds of halves for no apparent reason. This colony here seems to be doing very well though. They are improving, which shows how random this can be. So after our inspection, we were able to get some honey, which is uh, very promising for their first season being here. We do hope for a larger yield come springtime this year. This is, a, I would guess, is more eucalyptus honey, which is all our gum trees that we have. This would have been a lot earlier in the season. It's a lot darker. It's a more mixed floral. It's cut some out into this tray. Normally we extract it by spinning. But there are a few people who do like raw honey straight out the comb. It's actually pretty soft. There's a big chunk of honey. And here we have raw comb that has come straight from the hub. To do comb honey as a thing, we don't put wires, um, and also we don't put a foundation sheet because then you don't have that chewy center. Um, we just give, let them build comb all by themselves, and then you get this very very soft comb that is beautiful for for eating. Mm. As you can see, it's a lot clearer. Then the other honey. This is all eucalyptus. Mm, that is definitely eucalyptus honey.